Ladies and gentlemen, good to see you. We've changed venues uh, tonight. We thought we would try, see what it'd be like. I mean, I know you're tired of being cooped up in the house, and so we thought we would go outdoors today. So we did everything. We brought the pulpit outdoors. We brought a sound system outdoors. We brought a keyboard outdoors. Uh, so that so tonight uh, you are having an outdoor service. So so welcome to uh, Congregation of Brian Baptist Church. Welcome to those also on Facebook in different regions besides Pendleton, Oregon. And we're so glad to have you here as well. Uh, <clears throat> as is typical for an evening service, uh, we're going to start out by singing. And so the song is Footsteps of Jesus, or you may have in your book Footprints of Jesus as well. Uh, for those of you who have the Gray Songbook, Brian Baptist Church, that's number 685, 685, and uh, we're going to sing, and wherever you are, if you're in front of your television screen or whatever, uh, usually on a first song, we stand as we sing, and so feel free to stand, 685, and let's sing this song together. Sweet day. the gray songbook i do apologize for this but i have a chorus for you that is not in your book uh, but it is a chorus that so many of you are familiar with uh, whether you're attending brian baptist church or you're somewhere else in the region and that's called every day with jesus is sweeter than the day before and so we're going to sing that chorus through a couple times every day with jesus is sweeter than the day before let's sing together Yes. 
prayer. Let's pray together wherever you may be right now. And let's just ask God's help for this Sunday night service tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. Uh, we thank you that despite anything that we go through that you have not forgotten about us. Indeed, uh, you are paying very close attention to everything that is taking place. And so we pray, Lord, that you draw us together in fellowship, uh, the fellowship of the saints, whether near or far that you would give us a special focus and a gravity towards your word tonight, and that you would speak to us in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. So wherever you are now, you may be seated. And let me talk about the interesting things about being outside. And that is I started singing, and now the birds are trying to drown me out. They really are. They think, hey, this is great. Let's tune. Let's have choir practice. That is fun. And not only that, this is a very natural setting, which means there are gnats everywhere. Uh, they are not biting gnats, they are not stinging gnats, uh, but I'm afraid I'm gonna breathe in about a dozen of them before the service is over. And so uh, anyway, we're enjoying our time here. Um, and, and listen, um, I'm sorry I don't have this in the songbook. It's called Come to the Church in the Wildwood. It seems like this would be the perfect song for that. It's not in our, not in this particular uh, songbook, but it's certainly a great book. And what that means, Church in the Wildwood, Church in the Dell, um, you know, uh, my congregation is growing right now. I just saw a cat walk by. So uh, I know many, many things are happening. So here's what we're going to do. Um, uh, oh, how I love Jesus. Why? Because he first loved me. And so if you have your gray songbook, turn to number 92. Uh, that's number 92. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. We love him because he first loved us. So let's sing this song together. There is a name. sing a chorus that is called oh how he loves you and me uh, that is number 349 number 349 in your songbook and um, it talks about this and and as jesus says as the father hath loved me so have i loved you and uh, it's important to understand the love of god and uh, maybe there's other times in your life where you just really really need to know that god loves you 
and uh, know that he does. Uh, God's word um, is absolutely true, and God is true, and so he does love you very much. So let's sing this chorus together. 349 in the gray book. Oh, how he loves you and me. great job singing and I think I'm attracting more birds but I'm afraid I just lost one in the congregation uh, I saw the cat on a dead run and so I think one bird has gone to heaven uh, but uh, anyway uh, we are so glad again to be uh, with you tonight just um, a few announcements again some good news coming out of the state in that it is beginning to look like slowly but surely they're they're planning uh, to open some things up, uh, which I'm grateful for that. As a man who about three weeks ago cut my own hair, um, even the concept or the hope of, of a haircutting establishment opening up gives great hope to my life. And so uh, hopefully uh, that will happen. Uh, fortunately, most restaurants are still doing takeout, and uh, so that's a good thing as well. And so Anyway, just continue to pray for our state. Pray for wisdom for uh, those that are governing. And pray for your wisdom as well. Don't think even for a moment that you don't have a voice in this. Um, if you have a concern about something, um, <clears throat> you have city officials, you have a mayor, uh, you have an elected state representative, uh, you have an elected state senator, so don't, don't go around saying, hey, there's nothing I can do. <clears throat> there are some things you can do, and your voice does have meaning. And so, so use that voice, um, especially with things beginning to improve. Uh, this is the point where maybe you have to speak just a little bit louder and say, hey, I things, say things are getting better, and so what's all the gloom and doom about? So I came out from under my bed two and a half weeks ago and saw that the sun was still shining and the birds were still chirping. Uh, I haven't seen one single bird fall out of the sky due to coronavirus, okay? And, and I pet my cat, though my cat may be a carrier. I just warn you about that. Your cat and dogs may be carriers, okay? Um, that's why I only have a stuffed animal at home. And so anyway, so there's certain things that you want to think about as uh, we look to this. And so I'm going to, we're going to sing one more song before the message. Uh, one more song. Uh, that is number 575. 575. Before I do that, I, I want to give you, um, uh, I want to give kudos to my wife who got more views for her Sunday school class than I did for my sermon this morning. Congratulations uh, to Mrs. Watkins. And, um, and I haven't seen it come on Facebook, but I know it's inevitable. They're going to say, Pastor, why don't you teach your sermons to flannel graph? And I, I'm just not gifted that way. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm grateful for that, that things are looking up. And uh, just to, to talk to um, those involved in our shuttle ministry, our shuttle ministry is grounded. Uh, but I want you to know, and, I, and uh, I'll tell you more when I can. Obviously, I can't tell you this online because I can't use names online. Uh, but uh, but one of the families that used to be uh, in our shuttle ministry, some children, they've moved back to Pendleton. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about that at a later point. So 575. Now, 
wherever you are, maybe you're seated in front of your big screen TV or something, but you have to do this for me because this song is leaning on the everlasting arms and you cannot lean sitting down. You can only lean standing up. And so you have to stand up and um, now uh, social distancing um, doesn't apply at home. You know, you're with your family and everything so you can get as close as you want. When we sing the song Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, when it's time to lean, you just kind of have to lean, okay? And um, the wonderful thing is, is because I really can't see if you knock each other over, I have no idea. And so 575, what a fellowship, what a joy divine. And let's sing this song together. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. On the everlasting arms, what a blessedness, what a peace is like On the everlasting arms, Facebook camera, you just weren't aggressive enough at that on that verse. I know, I know you can do better. So here we go on verse two. Oh, how sweet the Lord in this pilgrim place. There is a first aid kit in the left-hand drawer in the kitchen. I think you guys will be okay. Okay, at this time, we're going to look in our Bibles uh, to the book of Luke, chapter 24. Just one moment here. Just a moment here. We'll get taken care of here. <clears throat> Luke, chapter 24. Looking in the Word of God tonight. And I'm going to start by reading verse 13 of Luke chapter 24. As we start this passage, some of you will recognize this passage as being something that happened um, really just, uh, I believe, the day that Jesus rose from the dead in a, a little bit of a different section, a little bit of a different area, but a very, very important passage, Luke chapter 24. And we're looking at verse 13. And so please read along with me. You go, Pastor, how's everything saying so stable on the pulpit? And the answer is everything is taped down. Uh, everything is taped. Uh, I've been outdoors long enough to know what can happen. And so everything is uh, taped down. Uh, Luke 24, looking at verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk? And are sad. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass here in these days? 
And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he that should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while we talked, while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures. Let us have a word of prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would impress upon us the truth of this passage and the truths of the scriptures to follow. And I pray that this would be a time of illumination for us and that we would allow you to speak to us in a new and special way. I pray, Lord, help us, help that our senses be not dull to the truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to explain this passage in a minute. If you're on Facebook and you're standing, you certainly can be seated now. Uh, I sometimes think that sometimes I'll tell somebody to stand on Facebook and, and maybe even after a morning service, they've still been standing for five hours. And um, anyway, you may be seated. I'm going to explain this passage in a minute. But first, I want everywhere, wherever you are, right now, I want you to close your eyes. I just want you to close your eyes and I want you to listen. And wherever you may be, if you're outside, uh, listen to the birds, listen to the wind. If you're inside, maybe you're listening to the hum of the refrigerator. But I just want you to stop for a moment and I want you to kind of get in touch with your senses. And I want you to stop, and for a moment, not looking, just stop and listen. So here's the question. Did some of you just look? You heard something and it was unexpected and you wondered, what is that? What is going on? And you see, sometimes it takes something that is really significant to bring us back to awareness, to make us think and maybe even to begin to make ourselves ask questions. Think about it. These two men looked right at Jesus and didn't see him. Now, some say, well, their eyes were holding that they would not know him. And some will say, well, that was a, a, a supernatural covering so they could not see him. But then there's others who say, no, they were just so preoccupied with their own sorrow that 
they they just looked at Jesus and they didn't know him. It was kind of like they spent most of the time walking um, in their somber state, more looking at the ground than looking at him. So they were walking right by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and they weren't aware that he was there. And so what does it take? And this is really the question of the message tonight. What does it take or what would it take for God to really get your attention? What will make you look? And I want to present this in four different questions. I want you to think of it in this manner. The first one, I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 3. Turn to the book of Exodus chapter 3. What would it take to make you look? What would it take to get your awareness? Exodus chapter 3, and we're starting at the very beginning of the chapter. Let me give you a few verses here. And it says, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Oreb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, and there's two very significant things that are going to happen here. So I want you to catch this. First is this. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. That is significant. The next thing is significant too. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And so in asking the question, what will make you look? The question is, will it take a burning bush to make you look? And what I mean by that is he turned aside to see this. In other words, is it what will make you look? What will make you think? Is it something that you can't explain that will finally make you look and ask questions? Something that has you perplexed? Something that has you questioning? Something that stops you and makes you turn aside? Something that stops you and makes you change direction and makes you focus something that'll make you look. I want you to understand something. God had to disrupt Moses' day and Moses' way to get his attention. You know, God did not call out until Moses turned aside. I picture it this way. And one of the only reasons that we have Moses in Scripture is because on a day when Moses worked to get his, when God worked to get Moses' attention, Moses turned aside. I wonder if we would have never found it in Scripture if Moses just looked and, uh, burning bush, uh, interesting, just kept on walking. But no, it stopped him. And it changed his mind and it changed his focus. It got him to change his direction. And it was absolutely necessary for God to get Moses' attention before he could speak to Moses. And understand, notice what then God said, you're on holy ground. Understand that God needs your awareness to bring you to a holy place. If he does not have your awareness, he will never get you there. He will never get you to that position. He will never get you to that place. There has to be something that heightens your senses. There has to be something that wakes you up to get to that point. Some people I know and they've trusted Christ as their personal savior and they've got their salvation patch and they know they're on their, their sins are forgiven. They know they're on their way to heaven. But past that, they never seem to wake up. They never seem to get to that next step. They never seem to pay attention to the proverbial burning bush in their life to turn them in the way so that God can get them to the holy place. What will make you look? Number one, would a burning bush make you look. Number two, would an impossible deliverance make you look? Turn with me to Acts chapter 12. The book of Acts 
looking at chapter 12, and I'm going to be looking in verse 5. Uh, for those of you who have been following with me the last week or so, uh, you heard me talk uh, about this from a little bit of a different subject. I talked about it in the perspective of a praying church. I talked about it in the perspective of a, a young girl named Rhoda. In fact, I had a young girl named Rhoda experience this week. Um, uh, my wife and I, we, we pass out Sunday school take-home papers to the children, and this new family uh, had come back into town, and so we got them Sunday school take-home papers. And so I knocked on the door so we could give them take-home papers, and a young girl answered, and she opened the door. She realized it was me and immediately slammed the door. And it was because, and she had slammed the door because she didn't like me. I'm just letting you know that. It wasn't a stranger danger thing. But what it was is she's just so excited to see me. She just slammed the door and went to tell others, just like Rhoda did, slammed the door and went and told the praying church that Peter was alive. And they went, okay, hey, don't bother us. We're praying. And then when she said, no, he's really alive, says, oh, he must have died. You saw his ghost. You know, it's so interesting to me that a church will pray in faith and then it happens and they go, nah, that couldn't have happened. And it does. We're looking at it instead from Peter's perspective. Look again. We're looking at Acts um, chapter 12 and looking with me at verse 5. And it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church of God for him. Let's look at it from Peter's perspective. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind upon thy sandals, and so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not, it meant he knew not, that it was true which was done by the angels, but thought he saw a vision. It's kind of like Peter thought, you know, this is the most excellent dream for me to have before I'm beheaded. You know, he says, I must be dreaming, but it's sure a good dream. I wonder what my last meal will be like. And so it says this, when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. Now, let me stop here and say this. They didn't have electricity back then. Okay. Now you go, you would look at this and go, yeah, that happens every time I go to Walmart anyway. An iron gate opens of its own accord. But back then, nothing like that ever took place. And so it says, and they went out and passed on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him. And look at this phrase. And when Peter was come to himself, all of a sudden, Peter was wide awake. Peter was come to his senses. Peter was aware of his surroundings. Peter came to this awareness that an incredible miracle and an impossible deliverance had taken place and said, now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. What will make you look? Would an impossible deliverance make you look. He came to himself. And what I mean by an impossible deliverance, some situation where you go, there's no way that you could escape. There was disaster afoot. It looked like it was certain to happen. But instead, this amazing deliverance happened. This amazing rescue happened. This amazing provision happened. This amazing turnaround happened that you were not expecting. And it got your attention. Would something like that make you look? Or would you go, oh, I got my stimulus check and just go on? Would it make you look? Okay, think of it this way. My mother as a child was in a swimming pool. And uh, let me just say the safety features of swimming and swimming pools were different during the days that my mother was a child. My mother is now 80 years old. And so my mother was probably about eight or nine years old at the time. So you do the math. Uh, my mother was in a swimming pool, but she could not swim. But it was okay. She's in the shallow section. But she accidentally drifted into the deep end and she couldn't swim. And so she was sinking like a rock. 
And so she'd sink like a rock. Her feet would touch the bottom. And so what she would do is she would push off with her feet, get back up above the water and yell, help, and go back under again. And then her feet would sink to the bottom again. She'd push off from the bottom. She'd get to the top and she'd yell, help, and she'd go down again. The third time she pushed off with her feet, she didn't make it to the top. And she thought, this is it. This is the end. And as she is going down for what she thought probably was the last time, a man's hand grabbed her arm and pulled her out of the water. It wasn't even a lifeguard, but it was somebody who somehow, a parent, was paying attention and saw that she is in real trouble. And it was a miraculous deliverance. There was a man in Montana. And uh, this man in Montana, he was a young man, maybe he was late teens, maybe he was early 20s, and he was despondent about his life. And he said, tonight is the night I'm going to take my life. And he went up into a high hill um, around the Bitterroot Mountains in Montana, sat there by himself with a gun in his hand, and he put the gun in his mouth to take his life. And he said it was all of a sudden like something erupted and all heaven and earth and a voice all around him just said one word, stop. And so he stopped and he took the gun out of his mouth, ripped the skin of his lips off because it was a cold night and the gun barrel had already frozen to his mouth. But it got his attention. And so the question is this. What would it take for you to pay attention? What kind of change? What kind of rescue? If you think back in your life and think of all the times you should not have made it. All the times that it should have been different. And ask yourself the question. Did any of those catch your attention? Or is it going to take another time to make you look? How about number three? How about an extreme consequence in life? Is that what it would take before you look? Look with me at Luke chapter 15. The book of Luke chapter 15, looking at verse 11. Luke 15 verse 11, and this is going to be a familiar parable to you. It says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself. Isn't it interesting, if you were to look at the process that the prodigal son went through, Anybody that could looking ahead would see eventually the end would be in sight. That eventually the money would run out. Eventually the job wouldn't be there anymore. Eventually somebody would be near to starvation. And yet it wasn't until he came to a certain point of extreme consequence that he woke up. Now some of you would use this term. You would say, And I heard a man say this to me one time. God brought me to the end of myself. Some of you here, some of you looking here, you're problem solvers. And you go, you have a problem. I can solve that. You have another problem. I can solve that. You have another problem. I can solve that. Uh, You have another problem. And you go, okay, I can solve that. And then you have another problem. And you go, okay, I can solve that. You have another problem. You go, okay, let me get on the phone. Hey, so-and-so, can you loan me? I can solve that. 
and you may be a problem solver and you keep solving your problems and God doesn't want you to solve your problems. God just wants to get your attention because God is really good at solving problems. What would really wake you up? Would it be a life-changing circumstance, a life-changing event? Would it be a serious injury? Would that wake you up? A genuine threat to your life? Would that wake you up? Or how about this? And sadly in the ministry, I've seen this as well. A senseless death of one close to you. And you realize the circumstances of your life and you go, that could have just as well been me. What will make you look? Fourth thing. Let us go back to Luke chapter 24 where we started. And let us look at a few verses in this passage again. Luke chapter 24 and looking at verse 30. And it came to pass as he, that would be Jesus, sat at meat with them. He took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them and their eyes were opened. And they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. But the other part of the story is this. And they said, one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures. And what they did is they said to one another, why didn't we get it? Why didn't we know it? Why didn't we see him? Because we already felt the evidence in our lives that something was going on here. And so a divine appointment, would it take a divine appointment to get you to look? Would it take a Holy Spirit revelation? In some ways, these two men were kicking themselves for not figuring it out because there was already something stirring in their spirits that said something is going on. A time when you know that God is speaking to you directly would that make you look? There was a young lady in Stevensville, Montana, a young mother, and um, she came to church the first time. I didn't know who she was. I don't remember who invited her. But after the service, she could not stop shaking and she could not stop crying. And as far as I know, she made a change of direction in her life on that day. She later wrote a letter and she said, my heart was pounding so hard because I knew that the Holy Spirit of God was speaking directly to me. Another divine appointment, a middle-aged alcoholic who had just lost his wife. He was going to lose his children because he'd lived a life of sin and alcoholism and all of a sudden he woke up and God spoke to him and he realized what had happened. But God got a hold of him. It was a divine appointment. He changed his life. He turned around and he never looked back. I remember another young expected mother who just the weekend before her stepfather had committed suicide. And I remember preaching a message. I remember not knowing very much who she was, but I remember her. Some people walk to the altar. Some people race to the altar. And she raced and she prayed and she didn't get up for the longest time. And it wasn't just, okay, I'm going to make this um, token commitment so I can come back in a couple weeks and make this token commitment again. No, she made a solid, life-changing commitment that she never turned back from. What would it take to make you look? What would it take for your life to be changed? I look at the people in the book of Haggai. And uh, looking, in, looking in the book of uh, Haggai, let me find that real quickly here. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. 
Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye who dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. And here is the question here. Are you still saying, yes, I want to do God's bidding. Someday, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, what will it take for you to stop saying later? I've known people in my life that have said later. Some of them are already in eternity because they said later until it was later and too late. What will it take? Or then there's this also in Matthew chapter 22, looking at verse 2. And we have a parable here about a wedding feast. Matthew chapter 22, looking at verse 2. And it says this, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. And again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner and my oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went on their ways. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. It's not important. Yeah, it's there, but it's not important. Church is there, but it's not important. Assembling together, it's there, but it's not important. What will it take for you to stop making light of God's church or making light even of the gospel of Jesus Christ? God was meeting with those men on the way to Emmaus and they didn't even know that God was meeting with them. You see, it takes a complete awareness. It takes a complete focus. It takes stopping and listening for God to meet with you. There are some songs that we sing in this hymnal. And I, I take note of the way the, the words are written in this hymnal. I notice that when we sing this song that we don't sing, Is your sum on the altar of a sacrifice laid? Or we also don't sing, Sum to Jesus I surrender. If you really want God to meet with you, if you really want God to speak with you, if you really want God to change your life, if you really want Him to have your attention and Him to speak you, it can't be some. It has to be all. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would use this simple message in our hearts and our lives. I think, Lord, of all the masses of people all across our nation, as little as two months ago, um, meeting in their churches or not meeting in their churches, some laying out a church thinking, you know, it's not important. Church will be there next week, next week, next week. Now all across this nation, there's a reality, there's awareness that some of the things that we take for granted may not always be available for us. Help us, Lord, to listen to you while there's still time to listen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
We are going to sing one more song. And that song in the gray book is 596. It's I Surrender All. I Surrender All. But let's sing this song together. And uh, just make it a prayer to your heart, to Almighty God. Why would you want to live your whole life and never hear God's voice? How important it is to hear it. So let's sing this together. 596 in the gray book, I Surrender All. speak wherever you may be, whether it be Berean Baptist Church or God's people, remember at this time to continue to pray for one another. Uh, we need prayer. Um, only prayer is going to get us out of the situation that we're in. Uh, be faithful to one another. Encourage one another. Uh, pray for the opening not only of your city or county or state, uh, pray for the opening of your country. Pray for our missionaries all over the world uh, that are going through this. Uh, I talked to a missionary uh, from the country of Colombia, and he said, right now, they allow us out of the house for two hours on Tuesday. They're not even able to leave their property. And so this is a worldwide thing. So continue uh, to pray regarding this. Let's hold each other up in prayer. And... Uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we will be back on Facebook Live. Uh, God bless you, and have a good week.